next couple of videos, we're gonna look at the OSI model and then the differences between TCP and UDP. These will be CCN videos that have been repackaging for the new CCNA. And that's because these topics have been moved over to the new CCNA. Now, it's interesting to know that the OSI model and the TCP IP model are not specifically mentioned in the new CCNA blueprint. However, it's most likely a assumption of a prerequisite to the new CCNA. And the reason for that is because the CCNA does mention a lot about layering. And it's very important as a network engineer to actually understand how the layers work. And when someone says layer three, for you to understand how layer three operates with four and two, the layers above and below it. It's also important to understand the encapsulation and decapsulation process, which we'll dive into in a lot more detail later. But first, OSI model now, TCP, UDP, and then we'll look at packet tracer and then jumping onto some physical equipment. So let's get started. Hello and welcome back to the CCNA journey with me, Ryan. And in this video, we're going to look at part one of the TCP IP and OSI model. For those who don't know, you can contact me here on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. I want to give an understanding of why these models are important and what they allow us to achieve. Now, here's four reasons of why we actually use models. They help us break down the bigger picture to help apply standards into network and architecture. They provide easier and logical troubleshooting and they allow vendor interoperability. Now, what you've got to keep in mind with these models is they don't actually physically exist. They're just a theoretical model that allows us to apply it to networking and to sort of how these protocols interact with one another. And from that, enable us to actually put forward these points that I've put in front of you now. So to give you kind of an example of that, let's think about vendor interoperability. Let's say we have our OSI model. And for those who don't know, the OSI model is actually a seven layer model. Each layer having a important role in actually providing a host to be able to communicate with one another. And we're gonna get into that in a bit, a bit later in the video series. But for now, let's just bear with me while I explain a few things. Now at layer two of the OSI model, this is called the data link. And it's essentially where protocols like Ethernet, PPP, HDLC, and many more run. But for now, I just want to be interested in Ethernet. Now we know from our previous videos that Ethernet is a protocol that runs on switches. Switches run at layer two. Now you can get switches that run above that, but for now they stick with the basics. So switch runs Ethernet at layer two. Now, if we are, let's say, a vendor for routers, and routers run at layer three, and we've decided we want to have a new product, and we're going to specify, uh, we're going to specialize in switching. Now, what we would need to do is essentially apply the standards that are in place to ensure that our switch is capable of running Ethernet. And providing we stick with those standards, what that will allow us to do is ultimately achieve vendor interoperability. So if we build our switch to the standards at layer two, then if we have another switch, let's say from another manufacturer, and we decide to plug that into our switch, we can be sure that the behavior of ethernet will be fine. What this also allows us to do is not have to worry about the upper layers. So let's think about our router. We know our router runs at layer three. If we were to plug a layer three device into there, and then maybe another router over here, we can be sure regardless if it's our switch or another manufacturer's switch, because we followed these standards, it's going to perform the same. And also because these standards have been followed, it allows vendor interoperability, meaning let's say this is a Cisco router and over here, maybe this is something like a, a Draytech. Regardless of what we use at this layer, it will work through our layer two ethernet because we've built it against those standards. It also allows logical troubleshooting. So let's have a think about when you're troubleshooting, there's actually a bunch of uh, troubleshooting theories that come along with the OSI model. So there's something called the top down and the bottom up and the divide and conquer. Now, let's just go through an example of that. Obviously top down would be starting at the 
application layer. So investigating things like HTTP and things like FTP. Whereas the bottom up would be checking out the physical cabling to begin with. Now, obviously from network engineers, we're more inclined to go from the physical up, whereas software engineers and, and other sort of professions may go top down. However, what's more common is you use the divide and conquer approach. So to give you an example of that, let's say we have a PC. We've decided to plug that PC into our newly switch, a newly built switch. And the first thing we do is try to ping this here, which happens to be, let's say, our default gateway on this segment. Now, straight away, if that was to actually work, what we've done there is we've skipped any troubleshooting required at layer two, and we've divided and conquered straight up to layer three, because this is where IP runs. Let's say now, for example, we actually we try to telnet to this particular router in order to manage it, but telnet didn't work. What that tells us is essentially anything up from layer four, where TCP and UDP sit, and up to the session, the presentation and application layer, something up here is causing that telnet to fail. And we can forget looking at anything with the physical, with the ethernet or with the IP, because we know from that ping and using that define and conquer approach, that is something above layer four. What I'm going to do now is jump into the models, the history of the models, how they come about to what they are today, and what models you need to be aware of in order to pass your CSENT certification. Okay, so there are a few models. Initially, it started with the ARPANET reference model in the 1970s, and then it moved into the widely adopted TCP IP model. And the TCP IP model is sometimes referred to as the DOD model. Initially, it started off with just four layers. As time progressed, they split it out the bottom into two, and you can see that it's using the data link and physical, similar to what we've just discussed in the OSI model. And this was a five layer model. And then what happened is as time progressed, OSI model, the Open System Interconnect model came out, and there's an organization called the International Organization for Standardization, um, actually written like this essentially, they came up with the Open System Interconnect model, and that was around in the 1980s. Now there's some historic around these models, and essentially some of the things to remember is, these here are sometimes referred to the upper layers, and the bottom from four downwards <clears throat> are referred to as the lower. And the reason for that is because in TCP, they decided to split that up, and a lot of engineers tend to group the application now, the reason they group it is because we, as network engineers, our responsibility tends to stop at the transport layer. Long as the transport layer is receiving the correct protocols and ports from the um, session layer and above, then we can be sure that the following layers will, will work. What you also notice is the naming convention. So here, obviously, it's called network interface and link, whereas it was changed to data link and physical. And you also notice that the layer three is called internet, whereas they changed it to the word network. For you as part of your ICND one, for your CSENT certifications, the two models that you need to be fully aware of is the updated version of the TCP IP and the open system interconnect model. Both of these you need to memorize and understand the differences between them as part of your exam. Now, a few other things to pick up on this slide. You may hear a legacy thing back in the ARPANET reference model. They played or well, they toyed around with the idea of having um, sub layers. So an example of that is if we go back, to, if we look at the OSI model, if we think of a protocol, for example, called ARP, the address resolution protocol, for those who don't know, this protocol essentially allows a host on a segment. So what I mean by that is a PC, maybe directly connect to another PC, or maybe there's an actual switch in the middle. Essentially the same broadcast domain. If they wanted to talk to one another, they had to have some sort of resolution in order to find the IP to MAC translation. So essentially a PC would ARP or request, essentially an ARP request out to the wire to everyone on the, on the wire who actually owns 
this particular IP address and for that person who owns that IP address to respond with their MAC address so then they can build the layer 2 frame in order to send their traffic. Now because ARP interacts with IP and it also interacts with Ethernet some concepts arise with saying maybe this particular protocol runs in between layers an example layer 2.5. So you may hear engineers refer to sort of sub layers if you like within and between other layers that already exist. Um, that's not so common nowadays. I think essentially the idea was with these models was ideally every protocol could fit into every model. However, as time progressed, it was clearly that wasn't going to be possible. So an example of that is if we think about a firewall, a firewall, it can block application level, which is all in the upper layers. It can block TCP, UDP, it can block IP, it can block Ethernet and has physical security. So you could argue firewall ones are all layers in the OSI model. So I think essentially as time progressed and they come up with splitting out this model into numerous layers, the idea was to split it up in order to capture all the protocols. But um, realistically, in hindsight, it's, it's certainly not possible. So that's kind of stopped at this seven layer. But nonetheless, you can very generalize almost every protocol into to each layer. And in turn, that helps us with troubleshooting and applying standards to the network. The last bit I want to pick up on this slide is something I've put here called a PDU. A PDU is a protocol data unit. And I'll go into this shortly, but if you ever think about um, something called encapsulation, if we have our data, let's say this is our data, essentially as the application moves down the stack, each layer puts its own header or called a PDU in front or essentially encapsulates the data. So to give you an example, let's think about transport. What it would do here is it will pick what transport protocol to use. And then it would pick what layer three protocol to use. And then it will put a MAC address on the front of it. And then it will tr transfer, transfer it across the wire to the actual receiving host. Essentially this header, if you like, and sometimes trailer in this end in layer two is the only one that adds the trailer. But essentially these headers are referred to as protocol data units and each protocol data unit from the session down has a unique name. So you need to be sure that when we're thinking about layer four, we're speaking in segments. When we're thinking about layer three, we're talking in packets. And then we think about layer two, we're talking in frames. And the same with layer one, it's bits. Sometimes I heard it called cells. Now, to give you an example, if we're thinking about a switch again, what we wouldn't say is, oh, you're switching packets. That's incorrect terminology because a packet is layer three. Okay, now if it was layer three switch, maybe that may apply, but for now, let's not go there. It's purely a layer two device. Therefore, the correct terminology would be it switches frames because it's concerned about the layer two element of the OSI model and in turn, the layer two element of the OSI model is called a frame. If you think about a hub, a hub is a dumb device that's not aware of anything else other than electrical signals. So you could say that this here repeats bits. You wouldn't say it repeats frames. So it's something just to keep in consideration. It may seem pretty pedantic in a sense, but it's certainly something you need to be aware of and will come up in some of the certifications as you move forward in your career. Okay, so what I want to do is cut that lesson a little bit short because I'm concerned with the next bit when we talk about the encapsulation and decapsulation process and go into the OSI model in more depth. We're going to need a full sort of 20 minutes to cover that off. And I don't want to cram it all into a longer video. So let's recap on what we've learned on this one. We looked at models and what they achieve. We know that it helps to apply standards into network and arch architecture and provides easier and logical troubleshooting. We had a quick look at the models. We looked at the DOD model. We spoke about the ARPA reference model and the open system interconnect. It's important to remember who created the open system interconnect model, the International Organization for Standardization, also referred to as the ISO. And again, that was in the 1980s. And then we also finished up with understanding what a PDU is. So a PDU is the header 
essentially, or in some or in some cases, the trailer that's added to the data as it traverses through the OSI model. And like I said, we'll get into that now in the next couple of videos, explain how that actually works and what runs each layer so you have a bit more of a solid foundation. For now, I just wanted to give you a bit of an introduction to that. I hope this video has been informative. I'd like to thank you for viewing. Please do like and subscribe.